Greetings, MBAP 516 online students. This is Dr. Jaros with an explanation for how exam number one was graded. Let's look at question number one. Question number one says, according to our readings, when a CEO is choosing their executive leadership team, there are pros and cons to choosing a team that is demographically diverse. Explain. Well, this comes from the Barnard reading. And Barnard says a about having a demographically diverse team. On the negative side, he argues that if a executive team is demographically diverse, then there might be insufficient fit or harmony among the members of the executive team. They might not, uh, such that they may not get along with each other and there might be arguments or too many too much argument argumentation and dissension and conflict because of the lack of a common background among the members of the executive team on the so that's the, the those are examples of of uh, negatives aspects of having a demographically diverse team on the other hand there are positives to having a demographically diverse executive team if the executive team is too demographically homogenous, meaning if all the people on the executive team have the same background demographically, then that f creates conformity of thought, what he calls an executive team that has a one-track mind, which means essentially that the executive team will not uh, get a diversity of opinions. It will not be as creative it will not come up with alternative points of view. It won't be able to think outside the box because the people ha all come from the same background and therefore tend to think alike. So diversity, demographic diversity is something that Barnard believes a company, an executive team should have, but only up to a certain point. You want to have a certain amount of demographic diversity so that you get a variety of viewpoints and fruitful debate and discussion, but you don't want the executive team to be so demographically diverse that there's no common ground among the members of the executive team, and therefore you have co conflict and too much disagreement. Okay, let's look at question number two. According to Fiedler's theory of motivation, what three situational factors determine the best style of leadership for a manager to use? Describe them. Well, the three situational factors are uh, task structure, position power, and leader-member relations. Leader-member relations refers to the nature of the relationship that is developed between the leader and his or her followers, meaning is there uh, a degree of trust and respect and affection between the leader and his followers. Position power refers to how much power and authority the leader has in terms of the ability to, in, to direct the activities of his or her subordinates and possibly reward or punish them as well. Task structure refers to whether the nature of the work that the subordinates are doing is clear, clearly defined or whether it's ambiguous. If the task structure of, a, of the subordinates' jobs is clearly defined, that means that it's easy and obvious for the leader to determine whether the subordinates have done the job correctly or not. On the other hand, if the job is task structure is ambiguous, that means that it is very difficult for the leader to determine if the subordinates have performed the job well or not, because the nature of the job itself is vague in terms of instructions, policies, procedures, and in terms of the content of what the subordinate is supposed to be doing. All right, let's look at question number three. Explain what the flying saucer study revealed about cognitive dissonance and why it is, why it is an important motivational force. Well, if you remember from the Fiedler article, he proposed that cognitive dissonance is a state of mind that occurs when someone has contradictory thoughts or feelings 
when they're experiencing contradictory thoughts and feelings, these thoughts and contradictory thoughts or feelings conflict with each other and create mental stress and anxiety, such that the individual uh, is compelled to resolve that dissonance and achieve a state of mental harmony. Well, in the flying saucer study, uh, there was a, Fiedler studied a cult of believers who thought that a flying saucer was going to come to Earth and scoop up all the members of the cult and take them away uh, somewhere into outer space uh, before the 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 uh, aliens, the, the 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 people flying around in the flying saucer, uh, destroyed the Earth. Okay. It didn't happen. You know, there was a prediction made that the flying saucer was going to scoop everyone up, all the cult members up, and, and take them away to safety at a certain point in time, at a certain date. And uh, this simply didn't happen. The date came uh, and went, and no flying saucer showed up, nor was the Earth destroyed. So the existence of, co of cognitive dissonance was confirmed because these cult members suddenly had contrary thoughts in their minds. On the one hand, they believed in what the cult was saying. You know, they were believers in the cult's religion. So they thought that a flying saucer was going to show up and that the earth was going to be destroyed. Okay. But on the other hand, it didn't happen. Okay. So on the one hand, you have belief in, in the religion, in the cult. But on the other hand, the facts were that what was supposed to happen according to the religion did not happen. Okay. What Festinger observed was that all of the members of the cult experienced stress and anxiety about this. It bothered them. It troubled them that what the cult had predicted was going to happen did not come to pass. So that showed that cognitive dissonance existed. The, the study also showed that cognitive dissonance is an important motive force because all the members of the cult were motivated to try to resolve that dissonance. And they resolved it in different ways. The members of the cult that had gathered together at the leader of the cult's house to wait for the saucer, they rationalized what had happened. They discussed what happened amongst themselves and came to the conclusion that the alien gods had actually decided to call off the destruction of the earth at the last minute. So in their minds, the beliefs of the religion or the cult were not disconfirmed. The aliens simply changed their minds about what was going to happen. And so they went on to continue to be members of the cult. On the other hand, there were some members of the cult that had stayed, that had waited for the flying saucers on their own by themselves in their own separate houses, rather than gathering at the location of the cult leader. These individuals, the ones who waited for the flying saucers at their own homes, they became disillusioned. They felt foolish and tricked. Uh, they said to themselves things like, you know, I can't believe that I ever believed in this religion. It's obviously fake. It's obviously phony because what it predicted would happen didn't happen. And they re responded to their cognitive dissonance by exiting the religion. They, re they achieved mental harmony by disavowing the religion and you know going on with their life in another uh, di spiritual direction. So the study proved that cognitive dissonance exists, number one. And it also, number two, proved that it is an important motive force because everyone in the cult was motivated to eliminate their dissonance, but they did so in different ways. Last but not least, let's look at question number four. Question number four says, what is strategic myopia and what can a good leader do about it? Well, first of all, strategic myopia is a problem that occurs when a leader is so imbricated or enmeshed in the culture of an organization that he or she cannot see strategic options for the business that do not fit with the organizational culture assumptions and values. So the key idea here about strategic myopia is it creates a kind of blinders effect. 
but the assumptions and values of an organization's culture limit what the leader can see about the business situation, about competitive conditions, and it also limits the kinds of ideas that they develop to address those, those, those business conditions. It basically limits them to thinking inside of the box created by the values and assumptions of the culture. And this can be very strategically dangerous for a company because the correct solution to the business problem may lie outside of those cultural values and assumptions. All right, so what can leaders do to overcome this strategic myopia? Um, one thing leaders must be is, you know, as Edgar Schein argues in the culture, uh, culture manager article, leaders must be partially embedded in the external environment. That is, leaders must get out of their office. They can't uh, be locked away in the ivory tower of the executive suite. They have to move around the organization. They have to circulate so that they get a feel for the business problems that lower level managers within the organization are experiencing. Shine also believes, and this is probably most important, that the leader has to maintain close contact and regular communication with those aspects of the organization that do have contact with the external environment. Areas like marketing, sales, purchasing, and the legal department. Customer service. Okay, is also very important because these are parts of the organization that interface directly with entities outside the organization, like suppliers, customers, and government regulators. These individuals have access to the information that the leader needs in order to overcome their myopia and make good decisions. Okay. That's my explanation for what I was looking for in your answers to the exam one questions. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know.